Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Essentially, Educate Girls is a nonprofit. We're about eight years old. I started it with a team of around 20 people, and I was just telling Antonio, next month we will hit over 1,000 employees. So it's been a really crazy journey over the last eight years. Uh, very quickly, we've scaled from 20 people to many, many more. Um, and I, today, I will just run you through our kind of our journey, um, what we do, how we do it, what's the problem in education, and specifically around girls' education that we are trying to resolve. Um, this is Jyotsna, and she's eight years old, and she's from Pali District in Rajasthan. Jyotsna starts her day really early. Um, she gets up before dawn, maybe around 4.35 a.m. She cooks, she cleans. Jyotsna doesn't go to school. This is Jyotsna's family. Her parents, they're farmers, her two younger brothers. And she's a, um, she doesn't go to school because her parents don't really believe in the value of education for her. They didn't go to school themselves and have she has basically no history of literacy or numeracy or any school going in her entire um, you know, genealogy. What is it that keeps girls out of school? For us, you know, we can talk about symptoms such as low status of women, we can talk about child marriage, we can talk about a lot of different things, but essentially these are symptoms. What really keeps girls out of school in a lot of places is simply patriarchy. It affects us in so many different ways, and girls' education is again affected deeply by patriarchy. I work in areas where a goat is an asset and a girl is a liability. That's what we believe. That the goat you can sell for cash, it's a marketable commodity, but when your daughter is born, she's a deep liability. She will go to somebody else's house. Why should I invest in her? And that's the kind of mindset that you're fighting um, when it comes to um, girls' education, specifically in very critical gender gap areas. When I look at this picture, I can almost map Jyotsna's rest of her life. She will hit puberty in a few years, and at that point she will get married, and she will be transferred to her husband's home. In a couple of years after that, she will have her children, she will probably be stuck in a cycle of poverty, the same as her parents, her own mother, or her grandmother. And she's not alone. In India, estimates are that between three to six million girls are out of school. Areas that I work have only around 44% female literacy. And other big pieces around child marriage. In the state of Rajasthan, where I work, 68% of the girls are child brides, 15% married below the age of 10. These are massive impediments to bringing them into school and to actually have them complete schooling. Only one in 100 girls in India actually completes class 12. So women like me who did finish and went to college are less than 1% of the country. 40% will drop out before the fifth grade. So again, there's a system-wide apathy for girls. Our government schools are centrally controlled, bureaucratically managed. There's chronic teacher shortages. Um, quality is obviously hugely questionable. And school infrastructure, again, plays a big role in keeping girls out of school. When I first started working in Rajasthan, only 40% of the schools had a separate toilet for girls. I have two daughters. I would not send them to a school if there wasn't even a bathroom for them to use. Today, the situation is much better in terms of, on paper, there are a lot more toilets. But every time I visit a school, I go and I see the toilet. And the last one I visited, it was built on the main road, and it had no doors, and it didn't have a roof. What's missing is really a sensitivity. It's a gender lens that's missing. The headmaster I spoke to said, we have a toilet. See, it's right there. But he didn't once think that a girl is never going to be, be able to use a toilet which is on the main road without a roof and without any doors. It's that sensitivity which is really at the core um, of whether it's at a community level or at a school level um, that we really try and build in a lot of ways. So what does Educate Girls do about all of these really huge issues? 
We go back into the same critical gender gap villages and we find a champion. These are young people who are educated, so they tend to be some of the most educated people in their own village. Between the ages of 18 to 35, but predominantly between 18 to 25 is the age group that we find. One per village. Um, we find them through a very rigorous process. We do newspaper ads, wall writing, recruitment events, really making this the most aspirational piece. We give them leadership training, mentoring. They see it as a job preparation program. Because if you're a rural youth and you might have completed your 12th grade, there's no internship, there's no job opportunity. So they see this particular program as a way for them to kind of get forward. And we give them recognition at the village level, at the state level, at the district level. They get 12 days of training a year, and every two weeks, they get a full-time Educate Girls employee that comes and spends time with them and mentors them. So it's a very high-touch program. But what do our champions do? They do three things. They go door-to-door -door in their villages and they find every single girl who's not in school. So they're doing a very accurate baselining. They're actually making sure that not even one girl gets left behind. Once they find the girl, they make community-level plans to bring her back into the school system and really talk to the school about improving infrastructure and making it girl-friendly. But we know that just her being enrolled and having the infrastructure is not enough. So they come three times into the classroom in the government school and actually teach. Because it's only when the learning outcomes shift that we know that a girl like Jyotsna, she needs to be enrolled in school, staying and learning to really have an impact. So coming back to Jyotsna's village, this is Deepika, she's 18 years old, and she's finished her 12th standard, and she's preparing for her bachelor's uh, through distance learning. So Deepika was enrolled as a Team Balika member in her village, and she went door to door and actually found Jyotsna, um, you know, at home and not enrolled in school. She talked to Jyotsna's parents and her family, really told them about the benefits of sending their daughter to school, and tried to convince them over days and weeks. However, nothing happened. Her parents just didn't agree. So she escalated it, and she called a village meeting, which had the headmaster, the panchayat raj uh, leaders. It had the, sort of the head of the village. It had other dropout girls from the, from the village who actually attended this particular meeting. And she tried to convince them further. It's after weeks and months of effort that finally she got Jyotsna enrolled into the school. But she knows that it really would be worthless if Jyotsna wasn't learning. So now Deepika comes into the classroom three times a week to actually do child-centric um, activity-based learning with the children, both boys and girls. So once we're in the classroom, we're actually gender neutral. Um, to make sure that those learning outcomes are moving. We work with the school management committees to make sure that infrastructure is improved. And Deepika is not alone. Today, we have 4,500 champions for girls' education working in some of the most critical gender gap villages. Thank you. And together, those 4,500 champions have brought back 100 and over 100,000 girls into the school system. Currently, that number is 103,000 girls in the last eight years, uh, which we think is absolutely fantastic. We've been able to close the gender gap in Pali, which was the first district where we started. And it's not a small district. It's 1,067 villages, over a quarter of a million children. And when I started in Pali, it had a 19% gender gap, which means that for every 100 boys, only 81 girls were in school. Today, Pali has a gender gap of around 5%. So that's the big shift that we've been able to see just with using community volunteers who are young, who are passionate and educated. We've improved learning outcomes for over half a million children, and schools with improved infrastructure is around 8,000. What do we want to do? We want to grow, and we want to cover more of the gender gap districts in India. By 2018, we hope to be in 16 districts in almost 30,000 schools, reaching around 3.5 million children. 
It's a huge task. Um, it means I have to raise a lot more money because we are only grant funded. Um, it will mean that our team size will grow to almost 15,000 volunteers and approximately 1,800 full-time staff. But it wasn't this growth or this fundraising that really kept me up at night. What really I was most worried about was that if we scale and we scale to such a huge number and we build this big organization, how can I really be sure that I will still have the same impact for that four millionth child who comes into our program? And that's a big question that a lot of social entrepreneurs and a lot of people who work in the nonprofit like me think about. Because what we're used to doing and what governments are used to doing is really scaling activities and inputs. You know, you say a library is really key for a school and then the government says we'll have a library in every school and you kind of carpet bomb every school with a library. This is very input-based stuff, but how do we make sure that if Jyotsna is learning to read and write and staying in school, that four millionth child will exhibit the same outcomes, if not more? And it's for this that we launched the world's first development impact bond in education. It's a performance-based contract that basically ties money to outcomes. And it wasn't easy. It took me three years. I went on a roadshow in India trying to pitch this to, to various funders and people, and nobody, uh, I went to Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore. No one stood up. We all talk about wanting innovation, but it's very hard when you actually go out looking for people to fund innovations. It took me two years of actually trying to find parties to, um, to help us do this. Uh, finally, we did, and we found uh, SIF, which is a foundation based in the UK, and UBS, Optimus Foundation, which is based out of Switzerland. And it took us a year to actually close on what is it that you would pay for if you had to pay in education. We have two pieces that we get paid on in the bond. One is enrollment of an out-of-school girl. So once we identify that a girl is out of school and it's verified by a third-party evaluator, if I bring her into school, then I get paid a certain amount. And then in terms of learning, so every unit of improvement in learning that is exhibited and verified by a third-party evaluator, there's a payment outcome tied to it. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because the learning is against a treatment and control. So we have 166 treatment schools and 166 control. So if I, my children move two units, of learning outcomes and the control moved one, I would get paid for one. So essentially, we've created a transaction in which I get paid only based on pure impact that I deliver towards the girl child. And this is what we felt was the way to go, that if I could create an organization that could deliver to such razor sharp outcomes, then I could be sure that when I reach that four millionth child, I know I will still be delivering real value to her and real impact for her. So it's an outcomes-based contract. Funding is tied to um, you know, actually achieving outcomes. In this case, it's enrollment of out-of-school girls, and then it's learning outcomes. Um, yeah. And why do we do all of this? Because when Jyotsna is in school, when she walks to school every day instead of grazing goats, I know that she'll be 40% more likely to immunize her children when she grows up. She will have a smaller and healthier family. She will be less likely to be a victim of domestic violence or get HIV or AIDS. She is the biggest asset that our country has. And the goat, well, it's just a goat. Thank you.